In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Uh, hello all. Uh, we are here with um, our beloved brother, uh, Diakon Hinok, who hails from uh, Los Angeles, from Debrecen uh, in the Cathedral. And uh, with the help of God, by His grace, uh, we are here to have a discussion based on uh, the week of Mukrab, the week of the synagogue, which is one of the um, weeks of what is known as Lent, also known as the Great Fast. Uh, and so, greetings, Diakon uh, Hinok. Uh, we thank uh, you for coming here uh, to be with us. Thank you for having me. Greetings and salutations to yourself. Salam lacha. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diakon Hinok. Um, obviously, this Great Fast is a fast that's filled with so much teaching. It's infused, you know, at every turn um, and at every week. And uh, every week has its own meaning, starting from Zawarida all the way until uh, until Hosanna. And uh, the week, the week that we're in, uh, that we're discussing today, which is the week of Mukrab, has uh, its own world of meaning. And so, I wanted to first start by asking you, what is the meaning behind Mukrab? Mukrab is a it's a great word. First of all, on a silly note just because we like to loosen up and warm the audience. Mukrab is a, we have to admit, it's a funny word to say. It has one of what we call the dik'ala fidel. You know, a lot of people will mess it up and they'll say ku, but it's ku. So it's already using one of the extra extra letters of the alphabet makes us think. Um, even actually the, the liturgy uh, assigned for this occasion on the Sunday is uh is our lords and it has the first word in the liturgy as a lot of a lot of things in our tradition the psalms of david the books of the bible liturgy are remembered by the first few words and it's na'akutaka so it's the same qu that oftentimes is itself just in my opinion on a linguistic and an aesthetic level it's just pleasing to the ear mukram when i was growing up in the church i used to ask people what is that weird word and it means synagogue. And synagogue is, is tricky because you have to distinguish the synagogue from the temple. But basically, prior to the New Testament, there's one temple and it's in Jerusalem and it was destroyed once, then it was rebuilt, then it was destroyed a second time and it has not been rebuilt to this very day. And the time that, it, the second time that the temple was destroyed was in 70 AD, mm-hmm. but prior to that, when jesus is growing up in the context of the new testament in the context of the first century palestinian territory which is under roman rule the temple is something which the romans like the persians before them and like the ottomans much later were people who had an empire but who were magnanimous they were generous and they allowed the peoples whom they conquered and palestine at this time was a conquered area to continue whatever religious services they had so long as they render unto caesar what is caesar's Mm -hmm. and so it is a territory run by the herods who are jewish kings under the roman authority and then the herods allow the temple uh which is the beta magnes the holy place or the sanctuary to be run by the Sadducees primarily, <coughs> excuse me, to be run by the Sadducees primarily, which are one of many different sects of Jews in the first century. And the temple is where the main animal sacrifice goes on. And so that's where the kind of priestly service or slavery unto God is being rendered, is in Jerusalem. Now the Jews are scattered everywhere, all across the world, and particularly the Hellenistic world, that is the world uh, conquered by Alexander the Great at a young age, but then he, you know, uh, passed away and his generals split up all his territory. And that world accepted and adopted the Greek culture. And so because of that, primarily because of the 70 elders in Alexandria, Egypt, there's a very early Greek translation. Controversially, one of my mentors, Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, believes that the final editors of the Old Testament themselves were the people who translated that. That's neither here nor there. But he thinks it's the most faithful translation 
of the Hebrew ever, the Septuagint. It's why it's so great. It's why all the Orthodox churches use it. Also because we didn't have anything else. But all these diasporic Jews would either have in Hebrew and Aramaic or in Hebrew, Aramaic, and in Greek, or just in Hebrew and Greek, the scriptures read aloud to them the same way we have them read aloud by the deacons like you and I, by the priests and the bishop if he's there, and sometimes even the patriarch if you've got an extra holy blessing. And so the, the rabbis, not the priests, but the rabbis, the teachers, would, uh, the rabboat, uh, which is often mistranslated in the liturgy, uh, as ten thousands in the English, that needs to be corrected. But the, it's the rabbis, the teachers, would read the scroll of the Torah, the, the scroll of the the law or the instruction, the prophets and the ketubim, which are the the comes the same word as ours, uh, kitab, the the writings or the the extra books. They would read the Bible out loud to their communities, and there would be no animal sacrifice. So the mukrab are all the synagogues outside of the city of Jerusalem where the temple is, where they would hear the word of God read aloud and they would be taught on it. And our Lord Jesus shows us in, in many of the different gospel accounts. Uh, the one that comes to mind for me the most is Luke chapter four, but there are plenty of times where he'll go open up the scroll. There's no binding at the time. So they're all separate scrolls, the scroll of Isaiah. And uh, we call it the Dedek Hadith in our tradition, the, the dry new Testament because of how rich the references to the Messiah are and, and how the New Testament authors used Isaiah. But he, he'd pull out the scroll of Isaiah, read it to them, and then he would teach them how he's going to free the captives and give sight to the blind and, and so on and so forth. So I, I hope uh, that's a, a good enough rambling of uh, the Mukrab. You gave us uh, a very macro scale um, you know, picture of the meaning behind Mukrab. And uh, you brought it ultimately to I think what um, our fathers intended when they gave this week to the term mukrab, and that is, it's a reference to the teaching of Christ in the, in the synagogue, in the temple. Uh, you mentioned Luke 4 and um, the reading of the scroll of Isaiah and how Christ at the conclusion of reading that passage from Isaiah, which is also known as uh, the fifth gospel, you, you gave another name for it, but all references to Isaiah's messianic uh, message. He says, this has been fulfilled before your eyes. I'm the one that Isaiah was talking about. And um, and especially since we're talking about Lent, the great fast, also known as the fast of Jesus, Troma Jesus, we're remembering the ministry of Christ, the teaching of Christ, how Christ was the teacher of the multitudes, the one that, you know, fulfilled their um their nourishment of the word of God. And so that week puts all of that into perspective. We oftentimes, you know, we start with the birth of Christ and we glance over the ministry and we go straight to the cross. But our father saying, hold a minute, let's spend these 40 days reflecting on the life of Christ in those three years in which he ministered on the earth. That was also, you know, necessary for salvation for him to be a role model for us to teach us the word of god and i wondered if you had any thoughts about that that salvific yeah I, I like how you you said the role model i i always point these kind of linguistic notes out to people but we are talking about his role and the primary role of the teacher is to first to read the scroll and the funny thing about reading is so often, you know, you and I are pr primarily speaking to a Western audience. We think of the activity of, of reading, of curling up in some nook in our room or maybe a nice bookstore with a little cup of joe that, uh, of course, originates in Ethiopia. And uh, we just read by ourselves and we read in our head. But the context of the Bible is so different. And the context of the Ethiopian society is far closer to the Bible than the context you and I were raised in the West in. In, in the context of Ethiopia, in the traditional schools, when you learn Nibabit, the reading house, you don't go and read in a corner by yourself. Mm -hmm. Even when you go practice a reading by yourself, you're yelling it out loud. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I, I know you're a, a master of music. I don't know what uh, it's called. Is it called a cacophony when the voices are clashing? What is it called when there are a bunch of clashing voices? Is that? Well, I, I'm not sure if this is a, a, a jargon term, but cacophony is by definition, you know, a host of clashing noises. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm not off there. So it's like a, a cacophony of voices where someone's reading Malik the Johannes, uh, first John over there. Someone's reading Mazmura Dawit, you know, chapter one over there. Someone else is on the way to Malka Marian and someone else over there is on Ankas Abrahan. Everyone is on different pages, right? And yet they're not reading selfishly. They're not reading for their own gain. Even the act of reading, which we consider to be the act of a rugged individual, is a communal act. Mm -hmm. it, it's being read out loud so that either the senior student can correct them or the teacher himself can correct them. Mm -hmm. And once they're all on the same page, you know, they come back and uh, they, they certify it and then they continue on to the next stage of either reading or, or, or chanting or, or wherever it may be. And so in this role of the mukrab, of the, of the synagogue, Jesus is our role model, as you said, by every little boy deacon who's ever read in front of the congregation is continuing the legacy that he began of not being a selfish reader, but reading publicly, reading before the great congregation reading in 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 community and so i think he he's our our role model like you said even in his in his ministry we need to to take after that i i think there's a a certain culture you'll correct me if i'm wrong where sometimes the desire may be to hold the biggest golden cross mm -hmm. or who gets to sing or who gets to preach and i don't know how many of us are like yes Today, I get to read communally. Mm -hmm. And of all of those things, uh, the reading communally is what we see our Lord Jesus doing. Obviously, he preaches and teaches as well. But the, the reading of the scroll, I think, is following in his footsteps. That's very true. And, you know, you mentioned the, the cultural, you know, the Nibab bit. And we can take it all the way to the liturgy. You know, in the liturgical, and I mean, you mentioned the liturgy actually right now. But to go into it into more depth, more detail, when we're talking about, you know, reading the scripture, it's not like everyone gets their own Bible and then we read silently and then we move on. When we look at the first half of the liturgy, the liturgy of the word, also known as, you know, Saratik Adasi, it revolves around this communal reading of, of, the, of the gospel of the New Testament. It starts with the lead deacon reading from the Pauline epistles from the scrolls of Paul. And then the assistant deacon reads from the general epistles, meaning the epistles of James and John and Jude, or from the Apocalypse of John, also known as Revelation. Uh, and then it continues on uh, to the assistant priest reading from the Acts of the Apostles, and then the lead deacon singing the Psalms, and then the lead priest, of course, reading the Gospel. And so all of this is a symbol, according to our fathers, of the ministry of Christ, particularly the lead priest throughout all of this is taking on the person of Christ and during the duration of the liturgy of the word is being a symbol of Christ ministering on to the multitude and at the conclusion of all these readings towards the end of Saratik Adasi after the priest has washed his hands if you want you can go to the to the Masakak Adasi it says in red print it says that the priest is rebuking is preaching essentially to the congregation by means of the selected readings from the lectionary so that they having been moved to the heart pierced to the heart like the multitude were when peter preached unto them might be able to come forward in purity and partake of the holy mysteries so the relationship between that you know uh the jewish practice the eastern practice of reading aloud and the orthodox practice of the eucharist of the liturgy of, you know, of putting on Christ are inextricably linked. I don't know if you'd agree with that. Yeah, no, I, I like that. It's obviously during the plague here, one of the things that we have missed the most is taking communion with one another. 
And of course, the context of the reading of the scriptures is, like you said, to teach and prepare the people to be in communion, not so everybody could tune into the live stream. And I'm very afraid that people realized that the sky didn't fall on their head the first time that they missed the Sunday without communion. And now it's been about 52 Sundays since they've missed communion, at least here in California, where we're pretty locked down. I know other places are more open in uh, Texas and Florida. And my concern is what's going to happen? You know, are the teachings, and there have been a lot of teachings in Amharic and English from your end, from my end, and from the fathers at uh, Virgin Mary's Ethiopian Orthodox Church, da daily teaching. I hope they take that teaching in, and like you said, it draws them to, you know, with ravenous hunger, come before the Lord to eat his flesh and to drink his blood. But I'm, I, I'm not so sure that is the case. And I remember before the plague, there used to be this saying that some of the fathers would say, and, you know, I've poked fun at them because they used to say, hey, if the Me'imanon, if the faithful aren't here, we can't do the liturgy. And now I don't see the faithful and we're still doing the liturgy. So it, it uh, you know, maybe it's one of those things where once you're in the situation, you change your mind according to the facts. And, and that's all fine and well, because I, I do think situational ethics are, are, are better than uh, the Kantian stuff, uh, all, all places all the time. Mm -hmm. But I, I am concerned that people may fall off and get complacent and continue the live stream. I want to see what's going to happen when when people are allowed to come back in are we going to continue live streaming or tell them to watch old episodes uh is there going to be a fear that people are going to want to miss out on the sensual nature the aesthetic nature of orthodox worship that that hits you with the fragrance of the incense with the visuals of all of the noaita kandasats with the sound of the liturgy with the taste of the communion and with the tactile senses of masallam or saluting mm -hmm. the walls of the church, the icons and, and everything else, the cross. Yeah, I mean, I would I would slightly disagree with the premise you said, and that is that the sky hasn't fallen on their heads. And I would say that in a way it has. They just haven't seen it or we haven't seen it. Spiritually, the sky has definitely fallen on our heads. And, and that's because as you brilliantly um, expounded for us, Orthodoxy stresses that there is a physical aspect to salvation. And we see this in the liturgy, when we're kissing the icons, the cross, and the gospel, and even the Eucharist itself, right? That, that sacrifice, that offering comes from, from the wine, from the bread, which comes from the wheat, which comes from the earth. The holy water, which we partake of, comes from the ocean, right? From the rivers, from the lakes. The, 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 the myron, the meron that we were chrismated by, comes from oil. So everything about the church is both spiritual and physical right we, we we understand that god created both both worlds and that he saw that both worlds were good and there's definitely a spiritual danger if we decide to to be complacent as you said and reject that aspect of of liturgy and hopefully i i, I hope that um that we won't fall into that danger because that's a theological danger. It's not just the danger of laziness, but when we're you know looking at the writings of the fathers, it's it's a danger of dogma too. It's a danger of, of the very substance of faith. But uh, returning to our discussion at hand about the week of Mukrab, um, I wanted maybe if we could go to the actual gospel reading um, that was assigned for the week. The gospel reading comes from John chapter two, uh, verse twelve, and it's until the end and i'm going to read it and then hopefully uh we can hear your thoughts on the matter yes you will function as the lead priest <laughs> I, I would far from far from that uh, we just want to read the word of god and it says after this he went down to capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples there they stayed for a few days when it was almost time for the jewish passover jesus went up to jerusalem in the temple courts he found people selling cattle sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. 
His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. This is the word of the Lord. May God be praised. So, I mean, can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. So let's just start by the general thoughts and then we'll try and hone in on different aspects. What are your thoughts on, on this reading? What does it say? What does it teach us? As always, I'm appreciative of the fathers who assembled the Gitzawe or the, that which is facing us, the lectionary, the schedule of readings, because you see here the fulfillment of the Misbach or the Psalm of the day, which uh, I believe it's 88 nine in the Septuagint. Um, anyway, it's Smaqnata Beta Kabala Anni Tayir Tomu La Yit A Yeruha Wadka Lailea Wokas Ayakawa Bas Om Lenafsea the zeal for your house has consumed me and the insults that were aimed at you have fallen upon me and I have bent the knee of my soul with fasting. And so it's during the fasting period and it's talking about how the zeal for his house has consumed him has has devoured him and we see him doing something as a zealous act a lot of times people want to justify whether or not they're correct their indignation by saying well what would jesus do well he did this what do you make of the gravity of what he's doing here. Oh, is that a question aimed at me? Yeah. Well, you know, that's actually a good question that you know I was, I was planning for us to get into. Um, as you said, the idea of manifestawikanat, spiritual zeal, is a very tough one. Uh, and St. Paul himself remarks on something uh, to a subject similar to this because he says, uh, that essentially, to paraphrase, you can be angry and not sin, right? You can be angry and not sin. There is a righteous indignation that exists in the world of virtue. But when to apply it is the question. When is it righteous? When is it not? And I think, again, for us to determine why the zeal of Christ was justified, because we know he's perfect, he's sinless, we have to look at, as you said, the gravity of the situation. In other words, what were the people doing that was so bad? And I think what caused or, or provoked the zeal of our Lord to show is in the most simple term, when someone was getting in the way of another person's spiritual progress. And the way I, and the reason why I say that is because we say we, we see in the gospel that the people were selling cattle and sheep and doves in the temple courts. Now these courts are, as Jesus says, a place for prayer place for prayer so people are coming there to pray to god they're coming there to be in touch with god to have communion with him and instead of being able to find that spiritual communion with god what they're finding is a spiritual stumbling block and that is people are trying to find a way to exploit their love for god as a financial gain for themselves and that a, of course, distracts a person from prayer, and B, it, it's a bad look, obviously, for the church because, or not the church, but for the temple, because now a person saying, why why should I, you know, uh, be so uh, concerned with the spiritual progress I'm making when the people out here, because obviously the Pharisees, Sadducees were okay with this when they're so concerned with worldly matters. So... These were the things that brought forward the upright and righteous indignation of Christ. But uh, I wonder what you would say, Debon Hino. How, what brought the zeal of Christ into the situation? That's right. And if, if I if I understand 
that context well, it's it seems like those people in particular who would have to pay more would be the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And so the big thing in the New Testament is that it's the same message as the Old Testament, but it's an invitation for the salvation of the biological children of Jacob, which are the Israelites, to be extended to the spiritual children of Jacob, mm -hmm. those who worship the God of Jacob. As we mentioned, whenever the gospel comes out, uh, um, the God of Jacob doesn't care about your biology. The God of Jacob is not wanting us to make distinctions based on heritage mm. in his house of prayer. What he's wanting is for those who have a broken heart, as we hear in the temple worship of the heavenly Jerusalem of Mount Zion, which are the Psalms of David, I believe it's Psalm 51. Mm. We pray it very often in the church. Mm. And it's the, the prayer of repentance. You know, it's God is close to those who are broken hearted, broken spirited, those of a contrite heart, mm. those who are penitent, mm. those who want to do a 180 degree turn away from their thoughts towards the thoughts of God, away from their vain talk towards speaking the words of God, away from their actions which have led them down the wrong path or several because the wrong paths are many and back to turning toward the one righteous path which is the the correct path of the of the lord and so as you said it's like in a way these money changers are denying the salvation that is offered to all of humankind. And what they don't realize when they do that is that they're acting as judges. Mm. And what they can't do is they can't act as judge because mm. the one judge is Jesus. Mm. And he will judge all those who've ever lived and all those who've ever died on the Tinsai Zagway, on the communal judgment on the, on the last day, which we actually see a, a few chapters later in John in John chapter five, we had a futat earlier this week in our church, and we have another futat later in this week. Mm. The, the prayer of release, the funerary rites continue. And um, that passage of John chapter five, which speaks of the communal judgment is is read every time as well. Mm. And, and and so I see, I see the judgment here. You know, zealous, another word for zealous is jealous. You know, our God is a jealous God. And so if you try to take his job title away from him, and his chief job title is judge, he's not going to like that. This is very true. Uh, and it, it it shows you, what you told us right now, shows us um, how serious Christ was about bringing the sheep to him. You know, And we see this repeatedly across the gospel. Our Lord left the 99 to find the one, right? To find the lost sheep. And when someone tries to get in the way of letting him being able to find that lost sheep, then, then our Lord becomes zealous. He wakes up from his slumber and casts his enemies apart, as we sing during the Sunday of Pascha or Easter. Uh, and we even see, you know, in Acts of the Apostle, the follower of Christ, St. Paul, is uncompromising in his position that circumcision is not necessary to become a Christian. It's a very similar issue to what we're talking about right now. He was uncompromising in that. And the reason why he was uncompromising is because, as you said, Dagwin Hainuk, God does not discriminate based on biology, based on race, um, based on these um, social constructs, to be honest, that we put on, on ourselves that divide us. These results of sin, you know, ever since the Tower of Babel that we've, you know, uh, imposed on ourselves. And it also makes us, you know, remember some of the struggles that we are encountering both as residents of the United States, as Americans, and also as Ethiopians, 
you know our struggle uh, with regards to divisions that we've imposed on ourselves. And I wonder what you would say in terms of how we as Orthodox Christians should approach these kind of divisions. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> in the book of Proverbs, it speaks of seven things that the Lord hates and the one that his soul abominates. Nafsu mm. atm is the person who sows the seed of discord mm. among the brethren. Mm. So we have the parable of the sower. Again, we find it in, in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 8, mm. but we find it elsewhere as well in the Matthew and I'm sure in Mark as well. I'd have to check that again, but I know for sure it's in Luke 8. And the, the sower is functional much like gabar hair or the 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 good servant servitude or slavery is functional and sewing is functional so the question is not is every orthodox christian a sewer i'm telling you right now all of you orthodox christians who are listening you are all sewers so the question is are you sowing the seed of discord amongst the brethren and the sistren, which is the thing that the soul of God abominates, mm. despises? Mm. Or are you sowing the seed, which is the word of God, mm. the word of the Lord that gives life? And obviously we should be doing the latter. And it's good to look at it on a scale, right? So we were divided as a synod for a very long time. And thank God that we're reunited. So the question is first, what were we doing to sow the seed of the word of God that is a seed of unity and fellowship and communion rather than a seed of discord mm -hmm. prior to that? Then... Once the reconciliation happened, what have we done since mm. on a synodal level? Yeah. If we want to think grander than that, what do we do to sow seeds of unity with the fellow people of our synod? Uh, excuse me, of our communion mm. with the Copts, with the Syriac, with the Armenian, with the Jacobite Indians with the Eritreans whom we share so much in common with. And this is actually one of those channels, I think, that uh, UOTY does very well at working between Ethiopians and Eritreans. Um, of course, now I'm engaged to my, my lovely uh, betrothed is Eritrean, so there's, there's a little bit of the ground that I'm doing to uh, bridge that gap as well. <laughs> and then we have to ask, well, what do we do with those even outside of our communion? Mm. Obviously, we can't take communion with them, but can we sing hymns with them? Can we feed the homeless with them? Can we um, you know, raise money, do other sort of charitable works? Can we visit the hospital and encourage people if they are of the Church of the East, if they're Greek Orthodox or of the Russians? If they're Roman Catholic, we won't mention the other Westerners for now, but we'll keep it there, at least among the high church folk, the people who have this, this lengthy heritage. What can we do? And then, and then that's me scaling it up. Then you could scale it back down. How's your Hagra Sidkat look? You know, how's your diocese? Have you visited any of the other parishes? Do you, do you know the other Sunday school servants of your diocese? And then you, you scale it down further. How many people do you know at, at your parish? During the pandemic, have you checked in on them? A lot of people are depressed. A lot of people are lonely. People don't realize like sunlight is not only good at getting you vitamin D to combat immune problems, but it has an effect on our mood. Sometimes we think that we can just will with our minds 
some sort of, uh, you know, it's almost like Hindi nirvana and that will never be in a bad mood. Some people haven't been in the sunlight because they're afraid of being in contact with people and contracting the plague. So it's our duty to check in on those people. Have we been doing our duty? Have we seen that everybody is okay? Have we done at least the basic thing, like a text? Have we done something further, a phone call? Maybe something like Romeo and uh, Juliet, you know, throw rocks at their window, I'm trying to talk to them from outside. You know, what, what have we done at the scale of our local community? And then of course, from the community is smaller than that is, is your, your household. And how often are you, you know, checking in with them? And again, are you sowing seeds of discord or sowing seeds of unity? Mm. That's a wonderful uh, way to uh, approach the application of what we're talking about. So thank you very much, Diego. You know, uh, I want to, you know, keep going on discussing the gospel because, you know, when we talk about the gospel, really, there is no end to the sea of wisdom um, that comes from uh, that comes forth from it. I want to talk specifically about the relationship between the temple and Christ, and the reason why I say this is. Uh, you know, in the gospel, almost nothing is said about the childhood of Christ, except for the one famous story about when St. Mary, our, our mother, the ever virgin St. Mary, and the guardian of, of the Holy Family, St. Joseph, forgot, you know, uh, Christ in Jerusalem. And I believe they were on their way to Passover as well. And where did they find him? They found him in the temple and they found him and they asked him why why you know why were you here and he said didn't you know that i would be here in my father's abode in my father's house and now fast forward he was 12 and now he is we'll say in his 30s so this is about you know 15 years 16 years later we find also christ coming to the temple during passover and then we see something very very interesting and that is the, it says the Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? That's a very polite way of saying, who do you think you are? Right? This person, this Messiah, this teacher of teachers, it keeps returning to the temple and they're saying, who do you think you are? And then he responds with that deep saying. He says, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. This is the Gospel of John. And I know, Diagon, you know, you're familiar with the mystic aspect of the Johannine Gospel. It's very different from the Synoptic Gospels. There's always a deeper meaning behind every word. So if you could talk about this relationship between Christ and the Temple uh, and the meaning of that in, in this, the story of salvation. Yeah, it's, uh, it is indeed mystical. It's the body of Christ. And we eat his body, and yet we are also his body. Mm. He is a lamb and yet he is a shepherd, mm. the good shepherd. It, it, it's very paradoxical. So the temple that they thought of is the physical building that they built. And this is the issue of man from the very beginning, even from Adam boasting about Eve being built out of his ribs all the way through the hustlers and swindlers and hornswogglers and quacks and charlatans of the Acts of the Apostles saying that they're working on behalf of the great god of Asia, Artemis. But really they were mad that Paul was making them lose money on the idols of clay and wood and gold and silver that they would make. They didn't really care about Artemis. In fact, they're probably more likely serving the spirit, the evil spirit of money, which is mammon. Mm. And that's what their primary focus was. And, and this is tough for us because it's one of those questions people ask all the time. When Christianity began erecting edifices or buildings after the legalization of Christianity, was it that they desired to do so prior to and were not allowed? Or was it that there was a different thought? And, and there are different 
camps uh, about this, but I, I, I tend to be someone who still wants us to have aesthetically pleasing buildings, but for them to be minimalist, especially when the community can't afford it. But the community at the time put all their faith and trust in that temple where their priestly service happened. The Beit HaMakdas, the sanctuary, the, ho the holy place, for them is where they had the sacrifice of animals. That's where their atonement happened. And so that's their redemption. That's everything for them. And that, according to Isaiah chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 66, is an abomination to the Lord. Mm. Because it says that their incense is like pig blood to him mm. in chapter 1 of Isaiah. And in chapter 66, it's that famous line that heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. O son of Adam, O son of the ground, what type of house can you build for me? Mm. And so in a sense, what Jesus is doing is he's critiquing their temple and the faith that they put into it. Mm. And eventually when they try to overthrow the Romans, some 40 years later, they're destroyed because of it. Mm. But his body cannot be destroyed by them, but in a temporary matter. Mm -hmm. So they crucified him outside the gates of Jerusalem to try to put him to shame at Golgotha, the place of the skull. And yet he was raised by God the Father unto power. Mm -hmm. And for thousands of years, people have worn crosses around their neck to mock the fact that they tried to put him to death, mm. to put to shame, to humiliate them, to show them that they are powerless. Mm. And so his body is sitting at the right hand of his father, will judge all those who've ever lived. And we wear our crosses as reminders of that. And each one of us are considered members of that very body. Mm. And so People see these lines in Corinthians, your body is a temple. And again, they get stuck up on the individualism of our culture. Our body is a temple as a community because we are members of the body of Christ, of which Christ himself is the head, the ras. And we are, you know, the fingers, the eyes, the, the mustache. We're all the other body parts of the Lord. And so we are the temple of God. Mm. And we want to meet physically to take part in the sacraments. But we know we are not less Christians because we're being safe by staying at home. Mm. Because we are the temple of the Lord, of the Most High. Mm. And especially when we are reading the scriptures according to our tradition. And, and the greatest fulfillment is, of course, when we're communing. But even here, you and I separated by a little bit of geography and separated from all of our listeners by a lot of geography. You know, some people might be listening to us all over the English speaking world, South Africa and in New Zealand and Australia and in the UK, in addition to the United States and Canada. And yet, no matter how much geography separates us, we are the different bricks of the temple of the Lord. We are the various body parts mm. of the, the body of Christ. That's very true, yeah, you know, and it, it hits at the, the meaning of what Christ is saying, as he said, when the Jews were here and when the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, you know, the leaders of, of, of those in the temple, you know, asked him, you know, who do you think you are? And Christ responds, destroy this temple in three days, uh, I'll build it up. Their mind immediately went to the the physical, the thing on the surface, to the, you know, atinka, atikmas, that St. Paul talks about. And so they weren't knowledgeable about the substantiveness. And that's, of course, John himself clarifies it. He says, if we go back to the gospel, it says, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. The destruction of the temple is the crucifixion of Christ. And the three days, of course, is the space between the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. And this 
in terms of its positioning in the great fast is a precursor to the feast at the conclusion of the fast, which is the resurrection of Christ, right? Pashka, Easter. And that's another thing I wanted to comment about. And that's the how, you know, Christ's relationship with the temple and the Passover from beginning to end is really just a pointing to the final event. And that's the resurrection of Christ. From the beginning, when he's born in Bethlehem, the sheep from Bethlehem are the ones that are chosen to become the sacrifice of the high priest in the temple for the remission of sins. He enters as a young kid in the temple. And then in his prime, in his ministry, he enters the temple again. And he's gazing upon the sacrifice. He's witnessing the sacrifice happening when in reality, he's the sacrifice. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one uh, who will fulfill the true Passover, the true Pashka, the true cleansing of the sins of the people. He is the true temple. And so that's a, there's a very, very paradoxical, mystical, and very deep meaning behind the acts of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as you said, we are called to be like him. He is the temple and he's the head of the temple. And by the way, for you know our viewers, our listeners, Beit HaMakdas is oftentimes what we refer to um, within the church. That means temple, right? The, sure, the temple of the Jews might have been destroyed in 70 AD, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, every church you walk into, every Orthodox church you walk into is a temple that has been consecrated for the glory of God and for our salvation. And so Christ is the head of that temple. And we, as members of the temple, people who go to the temple to partake of Christ, are, are we are we are the temple of the Holy Spirit who have received the grace of the Holy Spirit who have been illuminated by God to become partakers and enjoyers of his mysteries so I think there's a lot of deep um, messages that are behind um, that anything else you wanted to add yeah um, Deacon Mahirat and I grew up with his Beatitude of Buna Barnabas and whenever anyone says that phrase i can't help but think of him because every time he sees us and some of you may not ever expect to see a bishop like this you'd be very surprised and you would try to stop him and uh, you would be wronged because then you'd be disobedient to his authority but he bends down almost all the way to the ground like i mean he makes an l shape to bow before each and every single parishioner and especially us deacons and it feels so heavy when he does that but what he's doing when he says it he says to us salam laka o tabutu laman fasqdus salutations to you o tabernacle of the holy spirit he's reminding you that you are one of the bricks of the holy spirit and not because you're some great deacon, not because you're some great parishioner, but because you're one of the tiny bricks that make the temple of the Holy Spirit, you're worthy of being bowed down to. And he does that as a bishop. And so when you were mentioning that, I, in my head, I just pictured him like bowing to us and greeting us in that way. Yes. And it, it, it should always enlighten us to... Um, to the gravity of what it means to be a Christian. You know, we see a lot of things going on in the world. People desecrating their own bodies in the name of liberty. And we have to ask ourselves, just because I have the freedom to do something to my own body, doesn't necessarily, does it mean that I have to? Does it mean that, I, that it's moral? And, you know, we have to always take into account that your body was bought for, ransomed by a price, and that price being the blood of Christ. Your body was consecrated by the blood of Christ. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And as uh, his beatitude tells us, and as many fathers tell us, the temple, like any edifice, needs constant cleansing, cleaning, purification, catharsis, as the Greek fathers would say. So that means that we have to abstain from those things which we know will dirty and desecrate our bodies, right? We, we, not because of our own righteousness, 
but through the mercy of God are meant for a greater purpose. And so that means following the way of righteousness, taking care of our bodies, starting from the simplest thing, which is exercise and going down to the harder things, which is rejecting temptation, rejecting the sinful activities of the world and maintaining the straight and narrow path of virtue and righteousness. So thank you, Dequan Hing. All is permissible, but not all is useful. Hullum tafakwal, nagar gan hullum nagar aitakmam. And this is St. Paul that tells us this. Yes. Um, and he also says, I believe in, in Romans chapter 6, you know, just because we are now in the grace of Christ and no longer in the law, does that mean that we get to do whatever we want? No. That's, you know, the pitfall of a lot of Westerns, Westerners that fell into the heresy of antinomianism is they assume that because we have now been purchased by the blood of Christ, and because we are now, you know, beyond past the letter of the law, that we can now do whatever we want. No, St. Paul says to the contrary. Now we have to be even more righteous, but out of our love for Christ, out of our love for what Christ has done for our body and soul, what he has done for us. So uh, very true. All is, you know, free to do, but not all is as beneficial as we might think. Uh, <clears throat> let's move on to uh, a discussion now of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, and what I wanted to ask is, what is the relationship between the Pharisees and some of the pitfalls we're seeing in figures of power uh, in the world? Yeah, it's interesting. The Sadducees, again, are one of many groups in the first century Palestine. And they're the ones who were a minority in number and pretty much were the most anti-mystical. Mm. They didn't even accept any book outside of the first five books called the Pentateuch, right? The Orit, mm -hmm. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's their whole Bible. Mm -hmm. And that actually makes them similar to the Samaritans, at least regarding biblical canon. And they didn't believe in heaven and angels or the resurrection or anything. They just had their faith in this life. And that's why they held on to the temple power under the authority of the Herodian kings who were under the authority of Caesar. We see St. Paul uh, taking using that to his advantage. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Because he's a Pharisee and he did believe in the resurrection. And he knew his boys, the Pharisees, would uh, believe in the resurrection. So people have to realize Christianity is fundamentally an offshoot of the Pharisees. Mm. Because Paul is a Pharisee amongst Pharisees. And he has a huge role in the founding of the New Testament church. And of course, of the New Testament itself. You know, Luke and Mark, uh, Luke who writes Luke and Acts, both are his disciples. 14 epistles attributed to him uh that's a huge amount <laughs> that's that right there is a huge amount and then there's like he's in the wilderness for 15 years with all these different churches we don't know what he was doing there uh, in galatians we just hear he's out there so the pharisees were the majority sect you also have the zealots who led the rebellion uh, people who liked cutting off the ears of soldiers and, you know, wanted to fight the Romans. You have the Essenes who are in the Dead Sea uh, scroll community in Qumran who are hiding in their cave. They say everyone's corrupt and they want to live a like totally proto-monastic lifestyle. And, you know, you have all these different groups. The Pharisees are the majority. At the destruction of Jerusalem, the Pharisees are the ones that that made it basically to the present day pretty much all modern Jews and all modern Christians trace their heritage back to different groups of Pharisees. We're from the Pauline Pharisaical school. Uh, they're from the other Pharisaical, the rabbinical Pharisaical school that abolished priests. And they just have rabbis, which is why you see they have so much beef with the Ethiopian Jews who had their own priests still because it made them look bad that they didn't have priests. They're like, hey, we want to make temple sacrifice or if we can't, nobody can. And so the biggest thing we remember about Pharisees, the biggest passage is, I think, Matthew 23. And we see Pharisees, Sadducees, or, or scribes listed with hypocrites. 
Pharisees, scribes, and hypocrites. And so the biggest thing, you've mentioned it several times already in this broadcast, but the biggest thing about what makes someone pharisaical as an adjective is the idea that all their focus is on the external. All their focus is on the outside and they forget about the inside for us, which is the heart, which for the Semitic person is the resting place of their thoughts, which leads to their words, which leads to their deeds in uh, several places in Paul and in, and in the Lord, we hear that they're either whitewashed walls or whitewashed tombs. A whitewashed wall is a wall that's dirty and you just put a very thin layer coat of paint on it to cover up the dirtiness. A whitewashed tomb is even worse in reference because it means you're dead on the inside. Uh, you're a zombie. You're dead, but you're walking around. And on the outside, you've got uh, the white paint. Um, a modern kind of example of this from uh, modern uh, secular music is the idea of, uh, or even, even secular film, the idea of um, trying to put a bow tie on a, you know, a brown bag full of fecal matter. You know, at the end of the day, it, it's still not a pleasant thing just because it has a red bow on it. Mm -hmm. And so the pharisaical lifestyle and pharisaical leadership is a leadership in which the person preaches one thing and does another. Now here's funny because this is where the self-righteous get attacked. Because in that Matthew 23, we are told that the Pharisees sit in the seat, which is to say the throne of Moses. And so he says, do what they tell you to do. Don't do as they do. Mm -hmm. So just because you see someone who's a Pharisee or a functional Pharisee, a hypocrite today, that does not excuse you in the same way you're talking about grace earlier, because some priest or some deacon or some bishop, some teacher is a hypocrite. It does not give me as their addressee license to go and be a hypocrite too. Instead, I have my righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, mm. which means I need to do what they tell me to do. And I need to do what they are not doing. Mm. That's very true. Very true. And it's also a warning for us. And I think this is something that um, some people, you know, we, we sometimes struggle with this. And that is a lot of us are very zealous about the tradition of the Orthodox Church. And especially I can speak for myself. I'm a very zealous about the apostolic tradition passed on to us by our fathers. But what Christ and what many of our saintly fathers have warned us is that you have to make a distinction between being a defender of tradition, which is virtue, and becoming an accuser of brethren. And one of the names of Satan, the adversary, the one of the names of the devil, the devil is Yuanda Moch Kasash, the accuser of brethren. And so what that means is that we shouldn't be like the Pharisees who are going around and pointing fingers and trying to put people down. But rather we have to follow the the lead of our saintly fathers, and that is using the love of Christ to pierce the heart of those who are going contrary to the tradition so we can bring them into the fold so we can bring them into the flock and together we can observe the beautiful you know tradition passed on to us from christ and the apostles to now and that's the way of orthodoxy the way of orthodoxy is defending tradition with zeal and with love you know hand in hand and um i think that's something that a lot of us can take into account we should beware um, of the pitfalls of the Pharisees. We should become a Paul type of Pharisee, you know, someone knowledgeable in the law, someone knowledgeable in what was taught to us by Christ, but someone who also has love, love for the Gentiles and the Jews, love for the slave and for the free, love for men and for women, for all accepted into the body of Christ. Um, anything you want to add in terms of the application for us? Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. And again, like, here we are, Deacon Mehret and I, participating in English language services because we love all of you. It's not because we need it. <laughs> if Deacon Mehrat and I wanted to go full bad Pharisee, we can go all in on Ge'ez and Amharic. You know, we would be fine 
in any monastery or traditional school in Ethiopia. And we could certainly act that way in America. But we are a Jew to Jews and we are Gentiles to Gentiles. And so the reason that we do these English language services in the first place is to go outside of the things that we love the most, hearing the Amharic and the Ge'ez, and to try to invite you all to enjoy these things with us. And if you can find some way in which you can do that yourself, find some way in which you can invite your friends to do godly things, try to do it. If you can't get one of your unchurched friends to go to church, maybe you can get them to listen to a teaching like this. If you can't get them to listen to a teaching like this, maybe you could get them to come with you to visit some sick people at the hospital or to go to your local soup kitchen. Very true, very true. Thank you, Diego. And the final thing I want for us to discuss as we draw to a close is you read for us and is from the Misbah for the appointed week. Uh, we pretty much covered the first two lines, so to speak. But the last line is very much appropriate because, you know, we're in the middle of a fast and it says, well, that's I but it's meaning uh, I, I believe you said I bent the knee of my soul with fasting. That That's the common English translation. But yeah, that's not a direct translation. I would say, you know, I, I uh, disciplined my soul with fasting or I, I don't want to say punished, but the verb in is sometimes is used as punished, but I don't want to give fasting a the bad connotation. People have already put bad connotations. I it sounds like onomatopoeia. It sounds like like a strike. Like, it does, right? Because I cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I disciplined my soul with fasting. And it, it reminds me a lot of what St. Paul says. Um, he says, you know, I, let, I want to discipline my flesh lest, I, you know, I having preached to others might lose salvation myself. So what's the value of disciplining one's soul? you know, oneself, when it's a soul, really it's talking about the soul and the body um, through fasting. Yeah, you know, I, I had another video on this recently, but the funny thing is how the ancient practices in the Horn of Africa and in the Eastern Mediterranean, from which, you know, earliest Christianity is found, uh, you know, the Levant writ large, Egypt, Ethiopia, is that these ancient practices are matching up with modern longevity science, the science of living long and living well. Mm. And so now, now people have fasting apps. It's, it's hilarious. People track their fasting mm. and they do various lengths. And one of the first things I'll say is this, we underestimate ourselves all the time. Mm. We underestimate how much we can do. Mm. Now I've never gone, for example, the, the, the full three days, before Easter or mm. Pascha. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, maybe one day I'll be able to. I've, I've never been able to do that. But I know physically I can, and I've got a mental block. As long as you're, you know, um, taking care of yourself like the week before drinking water and stuff, you'd be surprised how long you can last. And it's it's very interesting to to see how you can gradually and incrementally over a period of time get yourself used to that. Now, I've, I've put up in my shorter video the kind of various standards, and, and you texted me kind of other standards you've heard of. The, the ones I've heard of, you know, is midnight to noon, midnight to 3 p.m., and midnight to 6 p.m. among the monks. But you've told me sometimes it's been 5 p.m. or 7 p.m., depending on the occasion. Yeah. It sounds a little confusing, to be honest. So I just kept it simple at noon, 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. Yeah. With the 6 p.m. being a once a day eater, the 3 p.m. being a two small meals, but it could it could also be one meal a day. And the noon usually is a, you know, maybe two, two meals with a, a snack or two in between yeah. mi uh, noon and midnight. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, of course, the, the vegan diet between those hours. It, it, it's very interesting that during the fast the we have the dietary restriction which is the veganism and then we have the actual fasting mm -hmm. nowhere in the bible 
does it say go eat cook for 55 days that is a canonical restriction added by our bishops later to intensify the spiritual discipline of the fast but if you look at everywhere in the old testament and the new testament of fasting right we're recording this on the the culminating day of the fast of nineveh which is a little mini fast before the the great fast and the fast of nineveh if you look at it every animal every person puts sackcloth they pray unto the lord there's alms giving and they restrict themselves from all food and drink so i i've mentioned this before on other platforms and it bears repetition so many of us have said okay you know what i'm gonna fast i'm gonna wake up in the morning and have shiro and bunna instead of tips and that counts as fasting no mm -mm. Mm -mm. fasting is the restriction of food and drink period mm. fasting is to be dovetailed and coupled with alms giving yeah and with prayer with scriptural reading with liturgical attendance and with possible with sacraments if you can mm. so that is the aspect and we must of course try to upkeep the dietary restrictions of the veganism mm. after the fast but that is not the fast mm. and and it's important we understand what this basic word fasting means mm. so we do both of those things and that's what leads to some of the confusion but i want us to focus this season on fasting and be encouraged trust me don't shoot for the moon just yet but maybe aim for the clouds mm. and slowly you'll get there mm. uh, i mentioned this last year um we're exiting black history month so let me share again the words of the reverend dr martin luther king jr if you can't fly run if you can't run walk if you can't walk crawl but whatever you do keep moving towards the goal get better and better and better at increasing the amount of hours that you are fasting increasing your prayer and increasing your alms giving amen to that yeah uh, you can hear um you know <clears throat> i i had opportunity to see your video on the benefits of fasting which you know you, you guys can find on instagram um and i've seen you know i had opportunity to read a book about fasting that was written by a western um, scholar and he actually mentions ethiopian orthodox church in particular because as you've also noted in some of your other platforms we have more fasting days than we do uh, non-fasting days and he writes about our church in admiration because a person that would observe the fasting season in its fullness and i say a person because I don't know how many of us are fully observing it. I hope we are fully observing it, but I don't know how many of us are doing it. Would be in great health because the scientific readings <laughs> <laughs> the scientific readings tell us that being able to fast for that period, you know, the common usually is from midnight to three o'clock. Being able to fast for that period, the practice of being able to alternate between fasting and non-fasting and from non-fasting to fasting is really 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 good for the body of course we didn't need to read a book to know that we can look at our fathers and mothers our forefathers our foremothers who were diligent observers of the fasting season and lived long age and didn't age you know as people are doing so nowadays you know they were blessed with great age and so we can you know it, see the immediate benefit and impact by looking at our elders in society but past the physical benefits is as you said the spiritual benefit and what saint david's talking about the disciplining of the soul is so 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 important you know when we talk about asceticism that comes from the greek word which means discipline which means exercise we are called to a life of asceticism maybe that doesn't mean going to the desert and wearing a monk's robe and you know only eating once a week but what it does mean is that it means pushing ourselves 
pushing ourselves, not just the way a bodybuilder or, or athlete pushes themselves, but pushing ourselves out of love for Christ and out of concern for our salvation. And furthermore, as Deacon Hinoch said, fasting isn't just fasting, right? It's not just what it appears on the outer. In that case, we can just call it a hunger strike. What fasting is, is life, right? It's, it's the life of the Christian. It has to be coupled with all the other virtues. It has to be coupled with almsgiving. When we're sacrificing our breakfast and our lunch, we can use the money that we would have spent on those meals to give to the poor. And as St. John Chrysostom, Kedus Johannes Afor tells us, he who gives the poor loans to God. Let me repeat that again. So people maybe who have a very financial economic ear can hear. He who gives to the poor loans to God. Do you know how powerful that is? The God, the King of heaven and earth, not because we earned it, but in his mercy will be in debt to us if we are able to fulfill the basic obligation of helping our fellow man. So coupling that with almsgiving, coupling that with prayer, right? Unceasing prayer is part of fasting. Whenever we're fasting, we should be in prayer, constantly saying, Oh Lord Christ, have mercy upon me. Or in the lengthier form, Oh Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. The prayer of the publican, the one who in the end, contrary to the Pharisee, went home justified. We have to couple fasting with all of those things. And so I pray that God can help all of us in being able to get closer and closer to fasting with perfection. Obviously, Abitzom is based, or not based off, but is in following with the fasting instituted for us by Christ himself, meaning Jesus Christ himself went to Gadamic Orontos, to the desert, led by the Spirit, and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, abstaining from all food and water, and having triumphed over the temptations of the devil, instituted for us the practice of fasting in the New Testament. So we should follow his lead and pray that we might be able to put on Christ and fast as he did. May glory be to him. Amen. Yeah. I, I know we emphasize the spiritual, but just to play off the, uh, the selfishness of the audience who wants to live a long life. And in order to remember our fathers, I'll give the example. I'll give three examples from California for you, two from LA and one from the Bay. So a lot of, Habesha men are known for their karabat maskamacha and for not living the longest lives, for falling asleep with the Lord or not uh, in their 50s or 60s. Okay. In very recent times, we have seen our father, Mamhir Gabra Salasi, who baptized me as a baby and I got the privilege of serving as a clergy member with him. So I got to say, serve in the same sanctuary, same Beit HaMakdas with him, and he baptized me. That's incredible. He lived till he was 90 years old, and that's an estimated age. We had a parishioner who was an ambassador alongside my grandfather under the king, Hala Sallasi, Andarasi, or ambassador, Ahadu Saburi. He lived until he was 94 years old. And he was always in the front row of our church doing tasato or receiving the people's part of the liturgy and till his last breath receiving communion. And of course, we have his beatitude, Abu Namal Kasedik, the historical figure and who was our archbishop for a long time. And we called his name for many, many years. I think they said he was 95 or 97. That's a real estimated age. I'll tell you, my parents are in their mid to late 60s, and he was a, a spiritual advisor to the king and an old man when my parents were kids. So it's a real estimated age. I'll also tell you one year, they told me it was his 95th birthday, and the following year, they told me it was his 91st birthday. So it's a real estimated age. And of course, all three of these men lived lives of fasting. Mm. And so even if you have the selfish pursuit of of living a long life, pursue fasting by any means. And hopefully in time, we'll be doing it for the right reasons that Mehrat listed, which are 
seeking out the mercy and and the love of of God. Glory be to Him. Amen. And with those closing remarks, we say thank you to all of you who listen, and thank you, Jacqueline Hainuk, for taking time out of your day to to sit with me and to discuss these wonderful and important things. May glory be to God for all things. May praise and worship be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God. Amen. And may the intercession of the Holy Theotokos Saint Mary and all the saints be with us. Amen. Thank you.